Hello, everyone. Thank you for being with us this evening. We're so excited to have you. My name is T. Tran Lee, and I am the Senior Programs Manager at AAWW. For a quick visual description of me and my space, I am a Chinese, Vietnamese, American, gen agender person with big round glasses and very short black hair. I'm wearing a black tank top that has gray lacing along the collar, and behind me is a white wall. I am speaking to you from occupied Lenape Hoking, where we are grateful to past and present stewards of this land. Let us know where you are turning in from. Outside of being a programs coordinator at AAWW, I am also the shop steward for AAWW Union, founded in 2018. We just won our third contract after a long negotiation session. Back to Asian American Writers Workshop. For those of you who are new to us, please visit our website aaww.org where you can find our social media profiles as well as sign up for our robust newsletter to follow our workshops and events as they are announced. Uh, we have a newsletter coming out this Friday. We are happy to work with Jenna and Sarika of Pro Bono ASL for ASL Interpretation this evening. Thank you so much to you both. We are here to celebrate Eugenia Lee's latest poetry collection, Bianca, which has been widely lauded, courageous work. Bianca documents and confronts living in the throes of mental illness, complex trauma, and straddling the emotional spheres that orbit each other. Also reading tonight is phenomenal poet, Tarfia Faisala. Um, Tarfia will read first and then Eugenia will read and then we will move on to a moderated conversation with some time at the end for audience Q&A, which we'll call for when it's time. So first up is wonderful poet Tarfia Faisala. Tarfia Faisala is the author of Registers of Illuminated Villages um, from Grey, Grey Wolf in 2018. And her writing appears widely in the US and abroad and is translated into several languages. Tarfia is a recipient of a Fulbright Fellowship, three pushcart prizes, and other honors. Tarfia lives in Dallas, Texas. Please give a warm welcome to Tarfia Pesela. Hi, everybody. It's so good to be here to celebrate Bianca. I'm so excited about this um, beautiful collection that Eugenia has gifted us with. Um, ironically, I do not have a copy of my own book. Um, I don't. Somehow I just keep losing copies of my books. Um, so I thought I would do tonight is read, read what I think of as um, some B-sides. They're poems that never made it into either one of my first two books. And um, they're also a little bit older. And so they're a little bit scary to read in a slightly different way. My new thing lately has been trying to do something that scares me in a reading. Just cause you know, it's hard enough already. Might as well make it harder. So I'm going to start with a poem called Poem Full of Worry Ending with My Birth. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to also just say that part of why I wanted to read older poems is because I've known Eugenia for years now and it's been a real honor to sort of grow up beside another person one admires and respects like Eugenia. Um, and so it, it got me thinking about poems in the past. <clears throat> Poem full of worry ending with my birth. I worry that my friends will misunderstand my silence as a lack of love or interest instead of a tent city built for my own mind. I worry I can no longer pretend enough to get through another year of pretending I know that I understand time, though I can see my own hands. Sometimes I worry over how to dress in a world where a white woman wearing a scarf over her head is assumed to be cold. Whereas with my head cloaked, I am an immediate symbol of a war folks have been fighting eons deep before I was born, a meteor. I wrote that poem in part because I am an introvert and I always worry that um, 
my friends are going to get mad at me for uh, disappearing into my mind cave. This next poem is called Poem You've Been Waiting For. I don't completely understand why I wrote this poem, um, but I like it. I saw then that the white-eyed man leaning in to see if I was ready yet to go where he has been waiting to take me. I saw then the gnawing sounds my faith has been making. And I saw too that the shape it sings in is the color of cast iron mountains I drove so long to find. I forgot I had been looking for them, for the you I once knew and the you that was born waiting for me to find you. I have been twisting and turning across these lifetimes where forgetting me is what you do so you don't have to look at yourself. I saw that I would drown in a creek carved out of a field our incarnations forged the first path through to those mountains. I invited you to stroll with me again. I invited you to stroll with me there again for the first time to pause and sprawl in the grass while I read to you the poem you hadn't known you'd been waiting to hear. I read until you finally slept and all your jagged syntaxes softened into rest. You're always driving so far from me towards the me I worry without you is eternity. I lay there awake, keeping watch while you snored. I waited as I always seem to, for you to wake up and come back to me. And the last poem I'm going to read, which is a longer poem is called One Ocean. And I've sort of woven, this is the oldest of the poems I'm gonna read tonight. And I wanna shout out Diode, the journal that published me when I was um, a young poet and didn't have very many publications to my name. Um, but this is a poem called One Ocean in which I've woven uh, the story of Tilly Coom, who was a sort of famous orca. Some of you might know him from the documentary Blackfish, but I got really obsessed and interested in his stories. Um, in his story, Tilly Coom, uh, was an orca that uh, served as a shamu, but he was actually captured when he was a baby orca and then and then brought to what was then called Sealand and then later became SeaWorld. So there are sections that are in SeaWorld and then there are, I think there's a section where I'm also in Bangladesh. One Ocean, <clears throat> SeaWorld, San Antonio, 1989. Oceans away from that village in Bangladesh, the pond you once dove into, your body that lean, that rice hungry. Shamu sides across night sky, our applause wild and after the show, father, you are chosen to feed the resting whale. You take our hands, two daughters clasping silver scaled fish, reaching forward into that tooth jagged hollow of a mouth, mother waves. SeaWorld, San Diego. 2011. After the dregs of frozen lemonade have been slurped, after uneaten halves of stale sandwiches are tossed, and after a stuffed shamu is plucked from a bucket of overflowing identical orcas, bought, bagged in bright plastic, and after the last killer whale glissandos across the jumbotron, after sibling falls asleep, bloated belly, rising and falling across white sheets. Mother asks, do you remember that old stuffed Shamu you and your sister painted red? Sealand, Vancouver, 1985. The memory of a memory of ocean slanting bright across Tilikum through the metallic rush of filtered water, though the metallic rush of filtered water persists. I learn how each scar is the body stitching a story back into itself. Five years old and I understand palimpsest. I am and am not these thin white lines crisscrossing. 
Father mends his wide white nets beside the crib. Sister sleeps. Imagine writhing in that strange webbing. Tilikum shudders from one hard gray corner to another. Imagine sinking into water more foreign than water, thirsting always for salt. Nassau Bay, Texas, 1993. Brian licked. I stagger to where you curl in mother's lap asleep. Light salt struck. How could I have known your body would be flung a day later through the car window as though you were the net father cast across pond water, his hands not yet bronzed in guilt and grief on that steering wheel. The ocean, long scrolls of hammered tin. You breathe the old suburban in the end crumpled metal. I stand over you breathing hard. My tongue flicks out of its child's mouth licks salt water away from bruised and cracked corners. Um, I'm gonna skip ahead to uh, SeaWorld, San Diego, 2011. I denied we were cut from the same rough hewn fabric, immigrant father, veins thinned with waters of the Pabna. You fell asleep beside that steel river, dreaming America. The pale moon rises on the jumbotron above the pixelated ocean. We gaze from the third row of the soak zone in Shamu Stadium and sibling grins, tugs at my arm. Be kind to them, this child grown tall in a house hung with photos of a sister they will never know. Did I not cross two oceans to walk the land you sprang from? The bones of my wrist are still this small. Port of Chittagong, Bangladesh, 1995. From ghost hungry fog, hulking bodies of ships emerge. Sit up straight, you command. So I gather more of myself into the rage in me that gnaws and gnaws. You press a hand to your belly inside which sibling grows and grows. I too was once fettered as was the sister now buried. Tilikum splashes rows and rows of shrieking children with flicks of his black tail. Mother, what is cut free cannot be regrown. Inside me is a chained and hooded woman wailing. Inside you, sibling begins to unfurl. Tilikum unhinges his jaw for arms full of shimmering fish, glides back to his square of man-hauled filtered water. And this is the final section of the poem. Cox's Bazaar Beach, Bangladesh, 1983. Waves erase, then restore me. Father kneels to offer a cone crimson with chili roasted peanuts. His hand is the anchor binding me to myself before I let go into all that ocean. Inside mother, indigo waters in which sister twirls. The prayers whispered daily into me are the seams I will snip free, restitch. I will disobey and disobey. Tilikum is not yet a black writhing in a rough net, not yet a flicking scarred tail. For now only our bodies speak. We glimmer out of reach. We swim and swim out onto this glittering dark. Thank you all so much. I'm so excited to hear you read, Eugenia. Thank you so much, Tarvia, for your for sharing your beautiful work with us, your gorgeous poems. Um, thank you for sharing space with us this evening as well. Um, just uh, up next is our celebrated author, Bianca Eugenia Lee. Eugenia Lee is a Korean American poet and the author of two poetry collections, Bianca, out this year, and Blood Sparrows 
and Sparrows for, from uh, 2014. Poems from Bianca received Poetry Magazine's Best Hoken Prize and have appeared in numerous publications, including The Atlantic, The Nation, Plowshares, and the Best of the Net Anthology. Her essays have appeared in Time, The Rumpus, and elsewhere. Eugenia received her MFA from Sarah Lawrence College and serves as poetry editor at Androt at, at Andro Journal and Valentine's editor at Honey Literary. Without further ado, um, please join me in welcoming Eugenia. I should unmute myself. <laughs> Hi, hello everyone. I'm Eugenia. Um, I, I'm still not used to these Zoom readings where I can't see people's reactions, but I'm so grateful to be here, um, especially with Tarfia. I've been a fan of Tarfia for many, 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 many years. Um, I love both of her books and I just could hear Tarfia read all day. So thank you, Tarfia, for your beautiful reading um, and, to, and to hear the B-sides. Um, I feel like I've, I've seen these poems, though. but um, so grateful to be in conversation with you. And I will read four poems from Bianca. And I'll tell you a little bit about the book also in case some of you don't know. Um, so the book chronicles childhood abuse, domestic violence, parental incarceration. My father was in prison the entire time I was a teenager and parental deportation. He was eventually deported to Korea where he hadn't been since he was 10 years old um, as a way out of prison. And um. There were nine years between my first and second books, and they both sort of revisit the same narratives, but in totally different ways. During those nine years, there was a lot of life lived. I got married. I had two miscarriages. I had my son, and I also had the privilege of getting a lot of mental health help. I was diagnosed with bipolar 2 disorder and with complex PTSD, and in my early 20s, before my bipolar disorder had a name and I was wreaking havoc and getting trashed and blacking out, my friends would call the nightmare version of me, Bianca. And um, that was sort of my first practice in giving that part of myself a name and figuring out how to address it and begin to heal it. And it wasn't until my mid thirties that I was properly diagnosed and um, treated. And um, one of the other things I love to tell people is that motherhood gave me access to my rage. I, I was never able to be angry in the right ways or at the right people. I was always angry at myself, blaming at, blaming myself. And one of the first edits that I got back from my editor for Bianca was that I used the word rage too much. Um, and so this is the second poem in the book. And I managed to take out, I think, three rages and kept one in. The first leaf, I thought I forgave you. Then I took root and became someone's mother, this unending dread, ever checking for his breath. I have never wanted to be less like you than I do now, daily gauging the venom, how much of you blights my blood. When my baby wails, I ask whether I too could beat his body quiet. And when I choose to be a mother, choose to be tender to my child, a choice my mangled brain makes each day, my fury surges. The distance between him alive and him dead is how well I am. And I think about the woman in the news who poured water on her sleeping baby's face. And I think how for decades, I was grateful you never killed me how that was enough to make me think you loved me. I raged as a child, but never in the right direction. So when my therapist said that not killing me yet didn't mean not killing me ever, that if I had stayed, I would have died. I had to watch her get angry to know to get angry. On the eighth week of the pandemic, my son, whom I sheltered at home for all that time, found on our fifth floor balcony, a tiny green leaf, the width of his pinky. 
The last time we'd strolled outside, the city was frigid, frost everywhere we looked, and dad, let me tell you, the leaf stunned us both. Unexpected, like the olive branch snatched by the dove barreling back to the ark. He refused to let go. The first leaf of all the leaves my child will ever hold. He looks so much like his father, nothing at all like us. This next poem is called Bipolar Two Disorder First Evaluation. And um, there are some italics inside the text that quote the DSM-5 definition of the symptoms of bipolar two disorder. And I'll try to make that clear. Bipolar two disorder, first evaluation. Someone in a gunmetal trench coat stares across the street on 14th. The light flips green. He stays put. I stalk by, nod. He nods back. I veer right, stride south. The itch to swing around. If he's still there, human. If not, angel. I glance back, gone, nowhere in sight. A sighting, I'm sure, so sure, so sure, I float home. High episodes of euphoria. Someone's wedding lopsided on a hill, can't keep still. Distractibility. Drink till I can't drive, then drive to five years ago. Fuck in his new bed, can't sleep, never sleep. Decreased need for sleep. Gun it at dawn to what wrecked five years ago. Fuck this one on the floor. Excessive involvement in pleasurable activities with high potential for painful consequences. Let's call them painful consequences. The one who strapped me to his motorcycle, the one who trapped me in his shower, the one whose sister tried to die, who couldn't unless he choked me, who could but on the rooftop, in the conference room, at the bar, sexual indiscretions, or years prior, down 12 acetaminophens, twin dorm bed, bed, always in bed, hopelessness, major depressive episodes, then mid-try, a bright pull to rise. Why die when I can swim to Paris? Manhattan, you can't swing a dead cat without snagging a poet in Manhattan. Flight of ideas, inflated self-esteem or grandiosity. And can't I shut up, all caps, and turn down the music, cranked high, blaze down Pacific Coast Highway past midnight, past midnight, break into the Hollywood Bowl to dance, scale the stage, then dance, decide to learn, decide to learn to dive, to silk, to climb, a new language, I need help in 7,000 languages, increase in goal-directed activity, and the poet in me. A sucker for endings, 7,000 ways to end, none of them lush enough. This next poem is called June 14th, and the only thing you might need to know is that a DNC is a procedure offered to people who have missed miscarriages, which means that the body doesn't release the miscarriage. Um, which were both of mine. And it's also an abortion procedure. So it's being denied to so many people who need access to abortions, but also to people who are being forced to carry these um, dead embryos and fetuses inside of them. June 14th. My children, if I may call them that, that identical pair of beans, quick to arrive, then quick to die quit my body a year ago today. Not quit. I opted for the DNC to say they didn't leave. I did nothing to make them leave. They were taken in my sleep. The animal I became conjured the animal I once was. Fiend and brute and wretch back to the wreck my husband had never met. And that lie Pounding since the first night I woke howling next to him, startled, tentative, 
This life doesn't belong to you. I was warned about the nightmares that in our first years of marriage, my hells would hunt me in my sleep. All my life, my mother locked our knife block beneath the kitchen sink. Did you know not all women hide their knives from their husbands? I married a man who owns a knife sharpener. He slices everything soundlessly, the way he learned in a class about knives. I chop our produce with an air of panic, like a child who found the murder weapon. My husband once leapt out of a closet in the dark to make me laugh. I wept. No one prepares you for the terrors of a good man. My mother still calls to ask whether our doors are locked. Maybe there's no cure for this, the way the brain bends after trauma and bends the world with it. Even now, a baby cross-legged inside me. I scan the day for traces of soot sullying this honeyed life. Who was it years ago who told me, afraid and racked with undeserving, to find a mirror and look myself in the eyes? Um, fun fact, the day that I had a DNC procedure for my second miscarriage was the same day that I received and signed the contract for Bianca. This is uh, the last poem I'll read. It's called Gold. I've become the kind of creature who, on Sundays, fills seven small boxes with a bevy of pills to stick it out another week. When will I be fixed enough to hear my kids scream without tearing my father's phantom hands off me? How do demons, decades gone now, still ravage me? Tell me I am not the thing my child will have to survive. Tell me the mob I inherited will not touch my son. Yes, the cavalcade of all that's tried to kill me may forever raid my brain, but know this, in my mother's first language, the word for fracture, for crack, is the same as the word for gold. Every Thursday, for 21 months before my son was born, a doctor trained me to put the gun down and write. I understand. I am one of the lucky ones. Thank you. And thank you to Jenna and all of the ASL interpreters. Hi, Eugenia. Hello. Is it time for us to talk to each other? I think so. Hi. I feel okay, like cool. we need a proper catch up before, but <laughs> I know. I know. It's it's really funny to see you in this post in this Zoomlandia universe. Um, having not already seen each other for so many years. How are you? How is your heart and mind today? Hmm. I feel like I'm prepared for other questions, but not prepared for that one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. I'm okay. Yeah, it's very sunny over here. So that's nice. A lot of vitamin D happening. Mm -hmm. How are you? I'm also good. I'm also okay. Yeah. Yeah. These are good things. These are good things to be. Um, can I ask you a question about the book and about this process of writing the book? Yes, sure. So one of the things that I really love about the book is that you're so candid about mental health, which is this topic that I think that people are sort of um afraid to broach, but increasingly we're seeing that conversation happening in the mainstream. And, and also I feel like your book, because of that candor sort of also encourages us to maybe think about how the courage it takes to be imperfect. So as you were writing this book, are there, are, were those things that you were sort of consciously writing into the poems or did they sort of come alive as you were writing into them? When 
I first started writing poems toward what I thought was the second book. I was writing completely other poems. I was right. I thought that I was writing some kind of like spiritual manifesto and I didn't want to talk about myself anymore or my story anymore. Um, but I think it was really the pandemic that made me go in deep, especially with the mental illness stuff. Um, and the pandemic and also having my kid, I think because there are still family members in my family, like my youngest sister who have really undiagnosed mental illnesses and like cannot live because of them. And I was growing increasingly angry, increasingly frustrated, trying to send emails to family members and just not getting through to anybody, um, nobody getting help. And I think at, after I had my son, like I just didn't even have the bandwidth to be able to have those conversations anymore emotionally or time-wise. And they started to appear in my poems. And so I don't think that I set out to write about mental illness, but in a way, I just needed to say these things to somebody who would listen. And for a while, I thought I was saying them to myself. Um, and I think in a lot of ways, the pandemic really did open up that conversation culturally, I mean, it's still so stigmatized to talk about mental illnesses, but I think more people were coming to turn or, you know, starting to be okay with recognizing that everybody has experienced trauma and that trauma is deeply related to mental illnesses. And I think in a way that sort of also gave me that sense of not permission, but, but this sense that there was like I wanted to be part of that brewing, you know, people were starting to have these conversations and I wanted to talk about it. Like I, I, I'm, you know, you talked a little bit about being an introvert. I'm an extrovert and I think I just needed to share, but also that it was frustrating to me to, to learn a little bit more about mental illnesses and how one in four Americans lives with a mental illness. That's so many people. And we've, now as a culture started to talk more about how like one in four women have been sexually assaulted and how you know widespread that is but I think we still haven't come to terms with the fact that mental illness is something that that just as many people are living with um so yeah I think it kind of happened more organically and not super intentionally mm -hmm. I love what you're saying about needing to say it to somebody and then in a way then in the process of that listening being able to then listen more carefully to yourself about what you wanted to write into and what matters um as an introvert i sort of vacillate and i i'm, I'm an introvert who goes out which is you know i think confusing to my friends and family but, i'm the opposite um, i'm an extrovert who really? likes to stay in <laughs> oh my gosh see that's yeah what is anything? <laughs> um, I, I definitely know that I sort of feel like, you know, I think there was a period where I really maybe romanticized being solitary as a writer, you know, kind of and, and fetishized my own loneliness in a way. And I too felt very impacted, obviously, as we all did by the pandemic as a writer in the sense that I sort of was sort of like, oh my God, we, we need each other. I, I need people and I need to be needed in order to feel functional, you know? And I actually, okay, it's actually, I saw a TikTok about this, but um, <laughs> I saw a TikTok about the fact that women specifically need lots of oxytocin. Mm. Um, and so I've just have been thinking about sort of like the, the need for connection and then also sort of in a way, the need for connection to help you kind of understand what you're going through in a way. Hmm. Um, which I guess connects in a way to, I'm trying to connect it to the next question, which maybe is just completely unrelated and I'm just gonna completely pivot. But um, how do you, where are you in space and time as a writer right now? I know having a book out does so much and brings so much other kinds of energy into your life. So yeah, what are you thinking about? No, I think that is connected because before the pandemic, 
But after my first book, there was a period of three years when I was completely depressed. I wasn't writing. I stopped reading. Um, I really cut myself off from my entire writing community. I just stopped talking. I was like, the posts are not my friends anymore and stopped talking to everybody. And there was this deep fear when I did start to write again that I would have to find my people all over again. And I didn't know how to do that. Even though I lived in New York City, because I was staying in so much as the extrovert who stays in, I just, I still didn't know how to find people. And in a lot of ways, I don't, I don't know when people started to DM each other, but for me, that time was the pandemic. And I started to find out that, oh, my friends exist on the internet too. And I can, or I can text them, you know, like, I feel like you and I had a brief text exchange one time mid pandemic. Like I, I remember it so clearly for some reason. Um, and I started to talk to people more specifically writers, ask questions. And then as I knew that this book would come out, I was like, okay, well now I need to start doing things like post selfies on the internet. But I think um, more seriously, I'm still fit, trying to figure out what my relationship is to myself as a poet. I think I really lost that self when I got married to a non-creative person and had my kid. I think I just was like, all right, well, I guess this is what I'm doing and this is my identity now and kind of gave my entire self to this, to this family, um, which I learned later happens a lot when you've grown up in, in um, like toxic family environments and in abusive environments that you lose the authentic self and you don't figure out how to find your authentic self. Instead, you just form your identity around the people that you love and the people you're around. And I, and I had done that all my, through my twenties, all my life had sort of become whoever it was that my partner wanted me to be. And I did that when I got married and then I felt trapped in that. And I felt like I really had to fight to figure out who my writer self was. Um, and I'm still figuring that out. I think I recognize now though, that there is a community out there, but that we also have to be really intentional about reaching out to that community that I need to start to ask for help, like share work with my peers and and give feedback. But I've been, I feel like I've been lucky to find other poets in recent years who have been more like the reaching out person and for me to say like okay if I can't reach out to others because I'm incapable I can at the very least accept that these people actually do want to be my friends and want to talk about poems or you know read poems and in some ways um doing the book tour and having this book has really helped me to see that that we're not you know we Writer, writing is such a solitary thing, but we're not alone and that our community really is our writers. And I remember when I was younger, people would say poets read poetry and nobody else. And I, I get so offended by that, which I feel like is less true today. But I think now I've kind of come to a point where I'm like, okay, if it's just the poets reading my books, because poets are amazing and, um, and I trust them in a different way. And, but I think, you know, I am sort of wary, anticipating after all of these readings and this season, you know, what kind of writer am I? What kind of schedule do I need to keep in order to keep prioritizing myself and prioritize my writing? And I think that's a question that I'm still wrestling with and I haven't quite figured out. Mm -hmm. You touched on so many um, things that I want to open up. Um, so we have to figure out how to hang out in person sometime soon. Okay. Um, but I, it's, it's funny to hear you talk about that because I went through a very similar process and really felt and thought I was totally alone in that experience mm -hmm. of being, I don't know, sort of simultaneously, you know, whatever access might mean here into like a community and then kind of experienced what, you know, some folks call imposter syndrome or, you know, like I also... I saw a great meme today that was basically like, you know, the flip side of imposter syndrome is that you are a great trickster and yeah. you should embrace. I saw the same <laughs> one. You should embrace being so convincing. And I was like, I kind of like that. Um, 
way of thinking about it. But I, I went through a similar thing. Like I was in a, you know, public, whatever that means, relationship with another writer. And when it ended, I was just completely mortified and kind of like, you know, it felt a little bit like dragged myself back into the shadows. And, and I think it took me, a, and then I think I was writing, I wrote like a whole book that hopefully never, nobody ever will see of just like horrible poems processing everything. And um, so I think, and I, and I felt really alone and isolated and I kind of had decided to give up on myself as a writer and give up on, you know, the community and kind of just to basically to echo what you're saying, sort of decided that it wasn't for me and that I should never have maybe been there in the first place or, you know, what did I think I was doing anyway, whatever. And in the meantime, of course, the work is of being a writer professionally is, going on you know like we're we do reading we're doing readings we're teaching whatever so you have to all have to be able to put that imposter syndrome to the side enough to you know to just kind of do the practical work that pays the bills so um it's heartening to hear that i wasn't alone though i don't wish that experience on anyone you know on, on any of us and and i too feel sort of very like reconnected whatever that means mm -hmm. but also i think still kind of you know negotiating how and when I want to show up and in what spaces and leaning more into my introversion, which, you know, when, when people ask me if I go, I'm going to AWP or, you know, the AWP panel proposal, you know, request has started and I'm just like, no, don't ask me, I'm not doing it. I'm not going, you can't make me. Um, so I'm still kind of trying to figure out what kind of, what kind of writer I am in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, the other question I've been thinking about that I wanted to ask you is one of the things I love, you mentioned social media. And one of the things I love is your openness on social media and the way that joy and laughter is a big part of your social media content. And of course, kind of like acknowledgements of your family. And um, it's, it's making me think a little bit about something I read recently in a book called Who is Wellness For by Fariha Roshin. Um, where she kind of makes a distinction between being better and being whole. And when I look at your social media, I really see a whole person. So how do you approach social media? What's your relationship to it um, now and these days? I love my memes. <laughs> I love your memes too. I feel like in real life, I cope using humor a lot more than shows up in my poems and <laughs> my poems are not funny um I don't even know how they started but it started to become a little bit of an addiction just posting memes in my Instagram stories and I feel like I have a different relationship with each kind of social media like my Twitter self is different from my Instagram self is different from my Facebook self and um that might be my Aquarius rising kind of like wanting to curate the outward appearance a little bit, but I feel like Instagram is where I can just kind of be whatever I want. And at first I used to freak out about it because I used to be like, okay, well, this poet is looking at my Instagram stories and there's somebody who might one day, like I have a job interview with, you know, and I would get like stressed out. But then what I found actually is that people start to come out of the woodworks into the DM saying, oh my God, I really resonate with this one, but I can't post it because of blah, 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 but it's hilarious. Mm -hmm. And like, people start sharing their medications with me. People start like really opening up. And I think once that started to happen, I was like, oh, we're all so fucked up and we're all so regular in some ways. Like we all, like I would have never known that, you know, you had that period where you felt like you had to retreat and was like, okay, well, writer Tarfia, it's got to go, but you still have to perform her, you know? And I think that there are so many poets that I admired or even just friends who, who would come out and be like, oh yeah, no, I struggle with that. Or this meme really made me laugh. And I'm like, oh really? Because that was the dirtiest one. <laughs> and I just <laughs> feel more like I in some ways it helps my imposter syndrome because I think sometimes I do feel like, well, my brain is too broken and I'm not as smart as X, Y, Z people. And I compare myself all the time. And 
I think that when I post these memes that kind of give a little bit of a clue into the human side of who I am and just the regular like shitty person I am and see that people resonate with that side more than like the professional face, I start to remember like it is one in four people who are living with mental illness. That's like so many of our colleagues and peers and we just don't have the platform or sometimes the privilege to be able to talk about these things publicly. And I think um, now it feels more like, well, there's like an underground conversation happening and, and people, you know, I see more and more people posting like really terrible, you know, memes from accounts like PTSD's nuts or whatever. <laughs> and it just, it just like helps us to laugh, which helps us to survive. And I, I'm starting to see that that's in some ways, like as a public person who's talking more publicly about these kinds of topics, it's important to not be so serious all the time about it. Like it's hard enough already to have to live with it, even harder to have to write about it and then to have to read the writing about it over and over again. Like we need to be able to laugh. And I'm trying to figure out how to be that person more authentically, not just online, but in real life too. Mm -hmm. I love that. It, it makes me think about, you know, I'll see that what you're saying about comparison I'll see that whatever that quote that's like comparison is the thief of joy. And I'll just be like, I know, but you try you try living in a society. Just try living in a society. It's it's like it's it's really difficult to not, you know, sort of figure out sometimes where you are, you know, standing, you know, and also what you want and what your goals are. Like I think that the flip side of comparison is like inspiration, though that's a word that, you know, not everybody likes to use, but I don't know. I think inspiration is important. Um, I, I love so much of, of what you said, and I love also just how, um, warm hearted and open you are in talking about these, um, topics with all of us. Uh, I think we have some questions from folks that I'm going to read. So, um, uh, Marion Mitchell Donahue asks the poems and Bianca all fit together so well in this collection. Were they originally written around the same time or were they spread out and you wound, wound them together after some distance? They were um, written over the course of nine years, um, so much so that when my husband looked at my book and he looked at the first poem, he was like, wasn't that in your first book? And I was like, no, it's just a really old poem. Um, but there were a lot of really terrible poems. Like I said, I was, I thought I was working on a totally different book that didn't make it in at all. And I had no idea what book I was writing. And I received none of the fellowships or grants I applied for because I couldn't articulate like what the hell I was doing. I just had poems coming out, but they were about all different things. And it wasn't until the very end of trying to assemble a manuscript that it occurred to me that the title of the book was Bianca. And that the story I wanted to tell was about Bianca and who I was and how that person evolved into who I am today, but how Bianca is still a part of me and how I'm still having to manage her. And once I figured that out, then suddenly it became so clear which poems had to go, which were many of them, and which poems had to come in. And that was also the point at which I realized that I had that essay um, about the taxi driver that I'd written also like the year after my first book came out and I, you know, I'd shelved away. Um, but it occurred to me that that was also telling the story of Bianca. And I, I, at the time I was reading a lot of hybrid poetry collections. So I was like, I have permission to put this essay in this book too. And once I did that, then sort of the shape of the entire manuscript came together. So it really wasn't until the end of those nine years that I realized like what the hell I was doing. Um, and because I'm not the type of poet who starts out knowing I'm going to have a project book, although I'd like to, because it seems like a good entryway into like focusing yourself. Um, so sort of how this came to be. I love that. Um, thank you, Marion, so much for your question. Yes, thank you. Uh, and then Aurora Masum Javed asks, did your writing process or making process shift from the first book to the second? Yes very much um with the first i think because i didn't have a lot of the vocabulary i had access to especially regarding mental health or about trauma in general um and because my entire life i had lived 
lying about my family and not being able to tell the truth until I was in college. And so, and I wrote that first book in my twenties, I was still hiding a lot, but it, it came out in a lot of surreal language and, and I experimented more with form and with holes in, in the text. And I think with this one, because so many of the poems were written mid pandemic and my husband works in healthcare and he works at a hospital right outside of New York city. And I was just like, well, shit, we're all going to die. And I'm just going to, I just need to say these things, these like final things before I die. And I think the language that I started to use was just had more clarity and the way that I wanted to tell my story was more clear. And I didn't realize until the end that I was using so many couplets and tersets, I think, because I just wanted every line to be seen. I wanted every single word to be spotlit against the white space. Like I wanted everything to be read and heard in a way that I didn't when I wrote the poems in my first book. For that one, I was just kind of like, I'm going to be a little mysterious here and I'm I'm okay with that because I know what it is and you know people can kind of figure it out and it's like a puzzle or um you know not all the poems are like that but my favorite ones are but then in this one I think I have a lot less of that I think because I set out to be loud I love that turn up the volume thank you so much Aurora good to see you here always um I have uh, a question about, um, one question about the book, which is, do you have a favorite poem or do you believe in favorites in general? Favorite poem, like in life or from Bianca? In Bianca, from Bianca. Oh. Someone asked me this in an interview, in like a written interview, and I said, no. <laughs> but I think my secret favorite is the Zuihitsu that I wrote for Bianca. I think that was the, maybe like the last or second to last poem that I wrote for the book. And I think um, ever since I was young, I wanted to put these like snippets of journal entries and old Zanga entries into poems, but I never knew how to do it well, especially in my twenties, they were all terrible. But suddenly when I realized that the book was called Bianca, but I was like, but there's no poem that says the word Bianca in it. I need a, I need a Bianca poem. And so then I started to write and it started to become this sprawling, massive thing. And I realized it wanted to be a Zuihitsu. And then I, you know, and I was reading some Zuihitsus at the time. So I was like, well, now's my chance to put the Zangas in and to put these like old journal entries and these old conversations and um, allow Bianca to have a chance to speak. Like she was the one who really wanted to be a writer. You know, she like really thought she could make it in a way that I still don't. And it was sort of like, I got to write it with her, with that version of myself. And so I think it, that one is my secret favorite. I love that. I love it. Shout out to secret favorite. Not so um, secret anymore. <laughs> not so secret anymore. Um, we only have a couple of minutes left, but I can't resist asking this one last question, which is my new favorite question to ask people, which is, if you could be an insect, what would you be? Oh. I don't know enough about insects to answer this <laughs> question. From, now my imposter syndrome is really bubbling up to the surface. No, no, no. I'm no, like, no, I no. just saw no. a millipede, but I don't know if I want that many legs. Um, <laughs> I think I, I, I think I probably want to be like a cockroach, like something. Yeah, something that mm. lasts for a long time, but is just filthy and doesn't give a shit. Like, just like is gonna invade your space because it wants to. And I feel like I don't have that kind of energy yet, but I'd like to have that energy. You know, I want cockroach energy. And maybe that would help me with my imposter syndrome is to like walk into a space. Like I'm a fucking cockroach. I'm going to take over and you're going to scream and not know what to do with me. Um, or just try to kill me, but <laughs> I love it. I love that. It's so good to see you. So good to see you. Thank you so much for doing this, Tarfi. I really appreciate it. I'm such a fan of you and 
I love you. Thank you. I love you too. Big ditto. Thank you. Thank you so much to Eugenia and Tarfia. And thank you all for being here. Thank you, Eugenia and Tarfia, for sharing your works and spirits and conversation with us. It was so, so great. I was, felt so wonderful to be in this room. Um, thank you for that. And thank you to Jenna and Sarika for, from Pro Bono ASL for providing ASL interpretation. They're great friends of ours. We love them. Shout out to Pro Bono ASL. And finally, thank you to you, our audience, for sharing your Wednesday evening with us. And we will see you very, very soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank to you. you. Thank you.